Do you all know what happened to you yesterday when you prayed for? And you ended up on the floor. But how many of you, what was the first, very first time that it ever happened to you? One, two, three. Anyone here? Four. Do you know what, what it was? That's what I'm going to talk about today. All right. Um, some of you may have this book. It's an older book in your library. How many have this book? It's called A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23. Does anybody have this book? Ever read this book? I was going through my husband's books as I was unpacking some of their boxes when I moved. And I found this little book tucked away and I had read it years and years ago. I thought, well, that's, you know, it's small. So I think I'll read it again. It's perfectly wonderful because it helps you to know how much our heavenly shepherd loves us. Because the shepherd loves his sheep. He loves his sheep. And if you all could go on Amazon, it's going to be hard to get. Now they have a newer printing of this, but it's not the full book. It's been cannibalized. They only have little sections from this book. And I have bought almost all that I could find on Amazon <laughs> because I want to sell them at the camp this summer. It's just five dollars and I only have two. I gave one copy to Pastor and I have two left over for anyone who would like one of these little books. You can just leave the, um, give Pastor the five dollars but if you wonder just how much really Jesus loves you and the full meaning of Psalm 23, read this little book. Mark it up because it will really feed your spirit. It's wonderful, wonderful little book. And we have my husband's book, Free from the Past. For those who have hurts and angers and life is just throwing you a curveball so many times. And you're just heavy with all the things that have happened in your life. This little book will help you be set free because it will help you to give these things to Jesus so that he can set you completely free from the past. It's not a book that you read through. It's broken down in little short sections. Little short sections. And if you're reading a certain section and it brings back an unpleasant memory, stop reading. Take it to Jesus, that situation that has been brought back to your remembrance. It may have happened years ago and give that situation and the person that caused it to God. And as you pray it through and give it all to the Lord and pray blessing on the one who has hurt you so badly, which is what Jesus said we're to do, then you will be set free from the past. Many people have gotten greatly blessed from this book. sold out last summer and had to order a hundred more so that they would be available for the people who were coming to this campground in Virginia. Um, sister, could you hand these out to anyone who would like them? There are a lot of evangelists that would be coming, preaching three or four days, and then it changes to others. It's a free Pentecostal camp. It's been in business for 61 years. It's really a real well of revival in the Holy Ghost. And it's where we were trained up to go to the nations of the world. And it's, the food is free, the bed is free, and the blessings are free. <laughs> but they cost you everything. <laughs> Oh my. So, God is so good. 
He has blessings waiting for us that we don't know anything about. In my experience, I have been going there for 49 years. This is my 49th year. And I often teach at the 9.30 service in the morning. And I have found that anyone in the world who is really hungry for a deeper walk with Jesus, they will find their way to this campground. I don't care what nation they're living in, they will find their way here to be encouraged and set on fire for God and enlarged in the gifts of the Spirit. But now, the guys that work down in the, the filling stations in town, they have no idea where this place is. The police know where it is because when they find transients that are in the town, the police pick them up, bring them to camp, we feed them, we clean them up, we house them for a very short time, we give them money, put them on a bus, and send them on. So the police love this place. <laughs> <laughs> Keeps the camp town all cleaned up. Hallelujah. How many were especially blessed in their prayer time last night? Would anybody like to stand up and give the Lord glory? Tell us, share, share what the Lord has done for you. Stand up, sister. Give him glory. Yeah. Real loud. Well, uh, I just, I have been lukewarm. And, and I just really have uh, been on fire now. Pastor Rob has just been leading us and guiding us, and I'm just on fire, and I just can't wait to hear more. And, and I realized all of a sudden last night that I'll never know it all. I'll never learn it all. And, and um, I've just been so blessed. Everything I see and do today, I look at it as a blessing. What a blessing. Yeah. And I just uh, feel so full and happy. Mm -hmm. Jesus puts a new song in our heart, doesn't he? Yes. yes. Hallelujah. How many of you have a new song in your heart since you came closer to Jesus? Amen. Would you like to stand up and say that the Lord did for you last night? Um, Real this, close in my mind. Um, I just felt a more peace with God and just, um, like Nancy said, like a fire got reignited. I just felt really pleased to pray this morning. I just couldn't wait to pray. Mm -hmm. Just a good feeling all over. You've come into a new place then, haven't you? Yes, yes. How many of you all want to be in a new place in the Lord? Anybody else want to testify? Brother, you want to testify? Sure, sure. <laughs> well, I, I, I just praise God that I could even be here and that you could be here with us, uh, sister. I, I, my wife tells me, more than one time. So I wanted to speak in tongue for 30 years. That's true. Yes. <laughs> Some of my family have been raised in the Pentecostal church. I, I was, I'm a member of a Lutheran church, raised in a Lutheran church. I love the Lutheran church, but I wanted more than what, because I knew from other family members there was more. And, and since this revival has been taking place, with Pastor Rob the last five years. It's just, the Holy Spirit's been touching us in such a wonderful way. And yes, about two years ago, I was able to speak in tongues. Praise, Praise God. <laughs> but I want more. <laughs> and as uh, our sister here said, uh, there is more there for us. And, uh, and I'm seeking that. All I can say to you today is I, I've been kind of walking in that afterglow of yesterday again, you know, when we get together and you say, it's wonderful just to be touched by the Lord. And I tell you, I was having trouble with my cattle here a couple of days before. The old devil was trying to beat me down before this happened while my calves went right where they were supposed to go today. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> 
There's a lot of good perks that go with us, I'll tell you. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> it is. It is. And I'm looking for more tonight here, too. Praise God. Amen. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else who would like to testify of a blessing that they got last night? Wow. Well, I'm all right. Pastor? I, I don't want to think of a Lord then, but I was, I was the last one up. And, uh, and one, one of the things that, that I, I recognize is that no matter how close you are, you can always be closer. And I need to be closer all the time. I closer. And so I was asking for prayer, and uh, Brother Chapel laid hands on me. And I don't, I don't, I don't imagine that you're really black. But you know, all of a sudden it's like this. Gosh, this is sweet woman. She would do that. But but it was like it got it sounded like that. There was a sound that was like black. I went down. And then uh, I rolled the top of the thing over me. And all of a sudden there was a fire burning. And it was just enveloping me. And that's when I just started laughing and shouting in the spirit. And it was it was awesome. And you just knew the Holy Spirit was was going deeper. So uh, it was awesome. Amen. Amen. Praise oh God. God. <laughs> Our God is awesome. Yeah. Amen. We serve an awesome God. And He's got so much more for all of us as we pre as we press in and say, God, I'm hungry for the more. For the more. And you know, if you find it difficult to get to these meetings, that's a good sign because it means that the devil knows. He, the devil can see a little bit ahead. He can't see the whole story, but he can see a little bit ahead. And when he can see ahead that you're going to be, get a blessing, he'll put all kinds of roadblocks in your way. And so it's difficult. You have to press through and say, I am going to that meeting. I am going to get everything that God has for me. And you make that effort and you come and you get fantastically blessed. Amen. And you see what a liar the devil is. Yeah. Just like he was messing with your cows. That's right. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> you know you can take authority over that? Because in Genesis said he's given us power over all the creatures. I've seen that happen. Yes. Amen. Years ago when I was painting at camp up under the eaves of some of the buildings, where the wasps like to build their nests. And I knew my father used to keep bees. He used to have three hives of bees. And I know that paint upsets insects and makes them want to sting you. Perfume does too. And if you swat at them, that's the worst thing you can do. And I would just take authority over those wasps. And I said, you just stay right where you are, and you're not going to bother me at all. And most of the times, I never got stung. Yeah. Amen. So there are a lot of things that God can enlarge us in as we take authority of the Word. Father God, we thank you for that which you did yesterday. But today is a new day. And there's a fresh hunger in our hearts, O oh Lord, to be moved into a new place in you. To see you as redeemer, healer, comforter, husband, brother, father, all we need, our provider of every need. And we thank you, Lord, that you're here in this place tonight. We thank you that you have gathered your people from many denominations and brought them into this place that we can truly become one body unto you. Lord, cement our hearts one with another so that we will form a holy bond in peace and in joy. Thank you, Jesus. 
Lord, do a new work within each one of us. Let the word feed our spirit. Help us to release everything that's not like you into your lap. Forgive us, Lord, for the attitudes that we've had in the past. And lead us into that higher way that we might come to know you in all your beauty, all your glory, and all your love. Change us, Lord, that we might be more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Did you bring pen and paper? Is anybody lacking? Because we'll be going through a number of scriptures. And you're going to want to go through these again later on in your leisure time. Who needs paper and pen? Uh, okay. okay. Right, so on the back row over here. And you all got um, things to write with also, not only paper, but have a, in the ladies on the back row. Do you have something to write with? I know you need some paper. They need some paper on that. Yeah, thank you very much. We're going to start in the book of Revelation. And I want you to notice that that word, from the name of that book, does not have an S on the end of it. Many people mispronounce that the book of Revelation. They call it Revelations. But it's one revelation. It's a continuing revelation of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And we're going to start in the first chapter. What happened to you who came up here for prayer last night? And you found yourself on the floor in the arms of Jesus. How many of you felt the presence of Jesus in a way that you hadn't before? Yes. It was wonderful, wasn't it? You feel the peace and the love of the Lord. And it just envelops you. This is called being slain in the spirit. So write that down. Being slain in the spirit. S-L-A-I-N. This word is a road map of life. Or to put it in more modern terms, this is the GPS of life. The Lord just gave that to me this morning when I was thinking about it. In the road map. Let's put it in more current terms. It's a GPS. <laughs> if you need to find your way, then go to the Word. Go to the Word. Read the Word. Eat the Word. Digest the Word. Live the Word. Do the Word. Be obedient to the Word. And your life will be totally changed. And when we change, then all those people who are around us, they begin to change. And I have found that when we just go around doing our daily things in life, we don't think anybody notices us. But that's not true. People watch your life. And if you say that you're a Christian, they really watch your life. And they judge you. And they form opinions about you. How many of you have found that people do watch me? Let me see your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yes. So it's important that we live the word. That we not just speak it, but that we live it. And especially with your children. It's no good to tell them that it's important to do what Jesus said and then you not do it. And then you say, well, do as I say and not as I do. 
that's hypocrisy. You have got to show them with your own life, your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, how important the word is and that they can see your life, whether you're really living the word or not. Our Revelation chapter 1. <clears throat> Starting with verse 10. He says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. He was praying and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in the book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. He was praying in a deep place. How many of you, when you have prayed, you were able to see something that was not of the natural? Is there anyone here who's prayed and you have seen one, two, three, four, good? The Lord wants us for all of us. He wants to show us things as we come before the throne of grace. He doesn't want us to be children who are wandering in the dark, but he wants to show us. Jesus said that when the Holy Spirit came, he would show us things to come. He'll show us things before they happen. Have you ever been shown things before they happen, or you had a knowing that something was going to happen before it happened? And you, you one, two, three, oh, a lot of you, wonderful. Did you think you were weird because it happened? It was God. It was the Lord. So he was praying, and he, he hears this great voice, and he saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one likened to the Son of Man, clothed with a garment, down to the foot, and gird about the paps with a golden girdle. His hair and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as the flame of fire, and his feet like a defined brass, as if they burned in the furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Was it a sweet whisper of a voice? No, it was a loud and forceful voice, the voice as of many waters. And you know, cascading waters can make a roaring sound, like, like Niagara Falls, a roaring sound. <coughs> and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And what was his reaction? And when I saw him, he did what? He fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen and have the keys of hell and of death. And then he was given his instructions. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. And it's begun to be explained to him that which he is seen. Hallelujah. John has this incredible revelation of the eternal Christ. 
That's who he was seeing. He was seeing Jesus in his eternal form, in his majesty, and in his beauty. Hallelujah. So, when he was praying, he saw, he heard, he felt, he felt the physical touch of the Lord upon his body, and he received instructions. All right, now let's turn to Daniel. Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10, verse 1. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. And the thing was true, but the time appointed was long, and he understood. And he understood the thing that had understanding of the vision, and had understanding of the vision. So then Daniel says, in those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. When he said he was mourning, he was fasting. He was on what we call a Daniel fast. He, he ate some things, but the pleasant things he didn't eat. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth. Neither did I anoint myself at all, till three whole weeks were fulfilled. When you are really desperate for more of God, when you don't care what the price is, but you say, God, I've got to have more understanding of the word, I've got to have more power, I've got to have a new experience with you, and the Lord might suggest to you that you fast. The first three days of the fast are usually the most difficult because that is when you are detoxifying. And that's why it's important to drink lots and lots of water. You can do a limited fast like Daniel did or you can do a liquid fast, which is just juices, or if you're cooking, um, say, boiling lima beans and things, and you just take the liquid off of the beans and drink that. I've done many fasts. I have four children, and of course there was a lot of cooking to be done, and because the whole campground was built by prayer and fasting. And the leadership fasted a lot, a lot. And you, when we fasted up there, you still did your work. And they were in the big building program. This was in the 70s. And so we still did the labor while we were fasting. And many people went on 40-day fasts. The, uh, the leadership, had a son that was unsaved, and they were determined that he was going to come to the Lord, and without telling each other, the mom and dad, they each went on a 120-day fast. Amazing. And at the end of that fast, there was the World's Fair was being held in Washington State, and so the one the sister that had led my husband and me into the baptism in the Holy Spirit told her brother, I'll, I'll buy your plane ticket if you go up to the World's Fair and meet my friend up there who was a tremendous evangelist. And he really didn't want to be in the, the meetings that were scheduled for up there, but he did want to see the World's Fair. So dangling that that uh, worm in front of him, he went up there. And when he was in those meetings, a person came up to him and told him 
that he was to come out from under the pots and pans and come into the work of the Lord. Well, that person that prophesied in, over, over him did not know that he sold waterless cookware. <laughs> but the Lord knew that and called him out of the pots and pans to come into the service of the Lord. And he was so broken and the power of God was so heavy on him, he just fell to his knees and repented for the, for the, the life that he had been living and decided, okay, Lord, I'll quit running from God and I, I'll serve you. And the lady that had prophesied over him called his mom and dad and said, you, can, you don't have to fast anymore. He says, come to the Lord and been filled with the Holy Ghost. So that 120 day fast broke that tyranny that was over his life. Fasting changes you. You come into a new place in God. You learn to reach up into the heavenlies and pull down physical strength into your body. Fasting is important. And it's important to do it while you're young because when you're older, it's a little more difficult. Now, the, one of the founders of this camp, she fasted for many, many years on one meal a day. She ate one meal a day for many years because her daughter was going into the nations of the world and she went into very dangerous places. Like when she was in Nepal, they tried to poison her because it was against the law to convert to Christianity. And if you were caught even speaking to somebody about the Lord, you could go to jail. The laws have been changed now, but it used to be that to be converted, if you convert and you're baptized as a Christian, you'll spend 10 years in jail in that nation. And here she was, she was, she was witnessing to the royal family. God opened incredible doors to her. And somebody in the government wanted to get rid of her. And in one of the meals that she ate, they had poisoned her. And there were bodyguards that were stationed near the hotel room where she was staying. And they didn't see her for three days. And so they knew that poison was working. And they were just waiting long enough for them to go in and take, get the body. Well, when she first fell ill with that poison, her mother was praying. And one way she would hear from God is that she would shut her Bible and say, Lord, speak to me through the word. She'd close her eyes, open the Bible, put her finger down on the scripture and read it. And many times it was a word from the Lord. Has anybody else done that to get a word from the Lord? You have, and you have, and you have, good. My husband tried it, but it never worked with him. So I had to get it the hard way. <laughs> and the scripture that she opened up to was, and they shall sleep the sleep of death. She shut her Bible. She prayed some more. She closed her eyes, opened the word, put her finger on the Bible, read it, and they shall sleep the sleep of death. She knew her daughter was in deep trouble. She shut the Bible. The third time, the same thing happened. How many times? What likelihood is it that you open the Bible and get the same scripture three times in a row? It just doesn't happen unless it's a word from God. And on that word, she called the church to fasting and prayer. And the third day, that Sister Ruth was so ill. She came to herself because God went into that hotel room and healed her. And when she walked out of the door, those bodyguards almost passed out. Mm -hmm. The one who's leaving the camp now for Sister Ruth, her parents had died, her brother died, and she has died. 
the one who's leaving the camp now, is a little North Carolina lady. She came seven years after we did. And she's a great woman of faith. Great woman of faith. And when she was in Nepal, she had a team of people. And they were hanging at gospel tracks. And they had to be so careful because if the police had found them, they would end up in jail. Now, Nepali jails are not like our jails. They don't feed you. They don't really take care of you. You're thrown in the same room as mentally disturbed people. You're given two pennies a day to buy a cup of tea. That's it. And if you don't have family that comes and feeds you every day, you starve to death. They don't give you a blanket. They don't give you a pillow. They don't give you anything. It's a terrible, terrible situation. And here, Sister Jane was taking this team of people through the mountains there, where Everest is, the tallest mountains in the world, going through streams where there were leeches that would get on, and trails that were just about so wide, and you could just fall off the side of the mountain. And they were not, they were not mountain trekkers. They were just people like you and me doing a work for Jesus because that's what God had told them to do. And one time they were in a village and the head man of the village made them a wonderful meal. And they ate it with joy, praying over their food and praying over their water like we've been taught to do. And then they went on to finish the trek. It was about, it took about two weeks to go through this trail in the Himalayas. About six months later, a Nepali who had shown them which way that they were to go, that had figured out the trail that they were to take, went through one of those villages where the head man had made them such a nice meal. And the head man said to him, he said, how are your friends? And our friend said, oh, they're fine. They said they came back to Nepal and they um, just took the plane and went back to America and they're doing very well. The head man was stunned because he had poisoned the food to kill them. But they didn't get so much as a stomach ache. Because one of the things that Jesus said, you can eat deadly things and it will not harm you. That doesn't happen in the natural. It happens when you're in the spirit. Because God puts his hand over you in a supernatural way and preserves your life because you love him and you're doing something for him. So you don't have to have fear in your life about anything that God asks for you to do. Well, here's Daniel and he, he was fasting here. And in verse four, and in the four and 20th day of the first month, as that was by the side of the great river, which is Hadikel. Now this is the Tigris River, this is Iraq. This, this is the Tigris River. You might want to put that in the little margin of your Bible. Then I lifted up my eyes and looked. And behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of the fats. His body also was like the barrel, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire and his arms and his feet like in color to polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. Is that a soft, sweet voice? No, it's loud and noisy. Does this remind you of something somebody else saw? Okay, remember this is the Old Testament too. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves. When you have been prayed for, or when you're in a service, have you ever felt a trembling? Anybody ever felt trembling? You have. 
Anybody else? You have. Good. Did you know what it was? It was the anointing. It was the touch of God upon your body. And so that's what these men with Daniel felt. And so they ran because he didn't understand what was happening to them. Therefore, I was left alone and saw this great vision. And there remained no strength in me. For my comeliness was turned in me unto corruption, so I retained no strength. Yet heard I the voice of his words. And when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face and my face towards the ground. In other words, he was slain in the spirit. Hallelujah. And behold, a hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. So, we, who was he seeing? Who was Daniel seeing? Was he seeing the same thing that John the Revelator saw? Yes. He saw Jesus in his eternal form. He saw the Christ before he came to earth. Took him out of time in the spirit. He heard the voice of a multitude. He had no strength. He was in a deep sleep on his face. And he felt the physical touch of the Lord upon his body. Hallelujah. Well, now let's go to Ezekiel. Chapter 1. That's closer to the front of your Bible. Verse 1. Now it came to pass in the thirtieth year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river of Kibar, that the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. And verse 3 of chapter 1. The word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel the priest, the son of Ozi, in the land of Chaldeans by the river Kibar. And the hand of the Lord was there upon him. And he says, And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north. Now what happens is that God begins to show Ezekiel that which is about to come to pass. And he has this horrendous vision of this, these people, this army that's going to come and overwhelm the land. And it really, it just tears him up. And as he keeps, he keeps praying, he has this vision of the living creatures, these creatures that are in the heavenlies, with their wings, six wings, and they have eyes in their wings, and they're, they're always following the throne of God, saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And he begins to describe these living creatures. And then as we go further along in here, talks about how they, they flew in verse 24. And when they went, I heard the noise of their wings, like the noise of great waters, as the voice of the Almighty, the voice of speech as the noise of a host when they stood, they let down their wings, and there was a voice from the firmament that was over their heads when they stood and had let down their wings. And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of what? The likeness of a throne. As the appearance of a sapphire stone, and upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. And I saw as the color of amber, 
as the appearance fire around the bed within it, from the appearance of his loins even upward, and from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about. What was he seeing? Who was he seeing? Does it sound like what Ezekiel saw? Does it sound like what John saw? He was seeing Christ and his eternal form. Hallelujah. Verse 28 is the appearance of the bow that is in the clam in the day of rain. So is the appearance of the brightness round the bed. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And what, did, what was his reaction when he saw it? In verse 28. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face. And I heard a voice of one that spake. And he said unto me, Son of man, stand upon thy feet, and I will speak unto thee. And the Spirit entered unto me when he spake unto me, and set me upon my feet, that I heard him that spake unto me. And he said unto me, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation, that hath rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me, even unto this very day. For their impudent children and stiff-hearted, I do send thee unto them, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God. And then God warns him that they won't listen to him. It begins to show you that even when we are in a rebellious state, how much God loves us. That he will send people to us to try to set us on the proper path and to get out of that dreadful path that we're in because he loves us. He loves us so deeply. He loves us even when we're rebellious. But he joys over us when we follow him and serve him with all of our hearts. Hallelujah. And then he said, even though they won't listen to you, don't be afraid. He said, I'm going to, I'm going to be over you. I'm going to watch over you. And it's going to be okay. So he did exactly what John the Revelator did. He did exactly, his reaction was exactly what Ezekiel's reaction, what Daniel's reaction was. He fell on his face. He was slain in the spirit. Now, let's turn to chapter 3 of Ezekiel. Ezekiel is one of my favorite books. And if you read it sometime, just simply for the spiritual experiences that Ezekiel had, it will challenge you to yield yourself more and more to the Lord so that God can give you same types of experiences. He'll show you different things, but it'll, he will pick you up and carry you and show you things that only he knows. So in chapter 3, let's look at verse 12. Then the Spirit took me up, and I heard behind me a voice of a great rushing, saying, Blessed be the glory of the Lord from his place. I heard also the noise of the wings of the living creatures that touched one another, and the noise of the wheels over against them, and a noise of great rushing. So the Spirit lifted me up and took me away, and I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit. But the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. God carried him physically into a different place than where he, where he had been. Because in verse 15 it says, Then I came to them of the captivity of Tel Aviv that dwelt by the river of Kibar, and I sat where they sat and remained there astonished among them seven days. He was translated in the spirit. He was translated in the flesh. And so if that had happened to us, if we were here and suddenly you opened your eyes after this experience of seeing the living creatures and the sounds of heaven, 
and suddenly you're 50 miles away and you'd sit there astonished for seven days too. Amen? Mm, Amen. Yeah, yeah. And God gives him a word in verse 16 of that which he is to speak to the people. In verse 17, he says, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word at my mouth, and give them warning from me. And he gets his assignment. So then let's go over to chapter 8 of Ezekiel. Ezekiel had such wonderful experiences with the Lord. Tremendous experiences. In verse 1 of chapter 8, And it came to pass in the sixth year and the sixth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I sat in my house, and the elders of Judah sat before me, that the hand of the Lord God fell there upon me. Well, it was such a cataclysmic happening that he writes the date, and it was September the 17th, 592 B.C. Did you want to put that in the margin of your Bible? September 15th, 592 B.C. He said, The hand of the Lord fell upon me there. Verse 2, Then I beheld and lo, a likeness as the appearance of fire from the appearance of his loins even upward and from his loins even downward as the appearance of brightness, as the color of amber. Does that sound familiar to you? And he put forth the form of a hand and took me by a lock of my hair, and the Spirit lifted me up between earth and heaven and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate that looked toward the north, where was the seat of the image of jealousy. What is he talking about? There was an idol that the people had put in the temple of God in Jerusalem. Now, Ezekiel didn't know about this idol, but God knew about this idol. And it made him so angry. And he called it the image of jealousy. Remember God says in the Ten Commandments that he's a jealous God. He doesn't want us bowing down to anything or anyone but he himself. So he called it this image of jealousy in the entry. And he said further up to me, verse 6, Son of man, seest thou what they do? Even the great abominations that the house of Israel committed here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary? But turn ye yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. And so God carried him in the spirit. He said, he brought me to the door of the court. And when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. And he said unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I had digged in the wall, behold, a door. And he said unto me, Go in and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. So I went in and saw. And behold, every form of creeping things and abominable beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. And there stood before him 70 men of the ancients of the house of Israel. These were 70 priests, 70 older men, priests of God, who were standing before these abominable beasts. And in the midst of them stood this man, the son of Shaphat. And every man in his, with his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. They were worshiping these abominable things. Then said God unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the chambers of his imagery, for they say, The Lord seeth us not. The Lord hath forsaken the earth. And he said unto me, Turn ye yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. And he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat that woman weeping for Tammuz, 
Now, what is Temus? Temus was the god of love. She had a sexual addiction here. And then he said unto me, Hast thou seen us, O son of man? Turn ye yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. And he brought them into the inner court of the Lord's house. And behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men with their backs towards the temple, not facing God's temple, but their backs were towards the temple of the Lord and their faces towards the east, and they worship the sun towards the east. They were worshiping the sun God, not worshiping the Lord God. And it made God so angry, because here in the house that had been dedicated to him, the temple in Jerusalem, these things were going on. And, they, and the priests who were doing these things didn't think God saw, but God sees it all. Verse 17, then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger. And lo, they put, they put the branch to the nose. It's just, it was an ungodly gesture. Therefore will I also deal in fury. My eyes, eyes shall not spare, neither will I have pity. Though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear them. And God wants Ezekiel to warn the people that judgment is coming. And he's going to send invaders to come and bring judgment to the people. We must be careful how we live our life. That we not have hidden idols in our hearts. What do you love? What do you put before the Lord? Is your cat or your dog a hidden idol in your heart? Is your house an idol in your heart? Are your children idols in your heart? Sometimes we don't realize that these things are idols in our heart. Is your jewelry an idol in your heart? If God tells you to put it away, not to wear it anymore, would you be faithful to what God says? You might not understand it. You might not ask anybody else to do that. But as we are faithful in these things that he asks us to do, eventually down the line, sometimes it's years later, we realize why God has said that. And the big thing is because he wants us to be ready to lead others to him and to keep our focus on him because he is a jealous God. Ezekiel had many wonderful experiences in the Lord. And God spoke to him so often. Hallelujah. I was so proud of you people last night that when hands were laid on you, you did not stiffen up and all but one did not walk backwards. We are blessed being women because we learn more easily how to yield. With men, this comes in a more, more difficult, with greater difficulty. 
And the Lord wants to take us into the places in the Spirit to show us things to come, to give us instruction, to make us fruitful in the gospel, to make us soul winners, to take away fears, to come to know him in a new way. And when you feel the presence of the Lord come upon you and you yield to it, you go down on the floor. You're not unconscious. You can hear everything that's going on. And that's why there shouldn't be natural and foolish conversation around where people are slain in the spirit. Because it's the altar of God. It's, it's holy ground where people are down there and they're yielding to the Holy Spirit. And you want them to get everything they can get. And many times when you're down there, God begins to deal with deep hurts in your life. And as you allow the tears to come, you begin to cry very loud. And if you're filled with the Holy Ghost, you can pray it out in tongues, that which you're feeling, and the Holy Spirit will express in tongues that which you don't have the English words to express of how you feel. And he can take you back into that experience that you had that was so traumatic and so horrible. And as you give that experience to the Lord, you feel the contractions down here in the lower part of your abdomen. When Jesus was speaking about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that was coming, what did he say? He said, from your belly shall flow rivers of living water. And this is where the Holy Ghost lives, down in the belly area. And as you begin to pray deeply in tongues, this is where it comes from. It comes up and out and it will free you from that which is of the past. Hallelujah. It's wonderful. And you'll find that you're praying louder and louder and louder. You might not be a loud person. I was never a loud person. I was, my father was a pastor and at one time his office was in the upstairs of our house. And we, we children, we three children, literally had to tip around, tiptoe around the house to be quiet. So I was taught to be very quiet. And even after I was first filled with the Holy Spirit, it was very hard for me to pray loudly in tongues. And some of you, when you were filled with the Holy Ghost, you just said a few words very quietly in tongues. But when I begin to pray for people to be filled with the Holy Ghost. I get them to pray loudly, to speak loudly in tongues, because the devil is always going to try to shut you up. But the Lord wants you to be able to shout it out from the rooftops and take authority over the enemy. Hallelujah. Because he gives us that authority in the Holy Ghost and with the blood of Jesus. He gives us authority over all that the enemy would do in us and against us. Hallelujah. And so as you get, as you release yourself more and more to the Holy Spirit and pray it out in tongues, God will give you wonderful experiences. He will open your eyes and let you see things in the Spirit you've never seen before. And if when you're praying, you see a white light, step into it because it's a vision. Step into the vision. And God will show you what he wants to show you. We are in the schoolhouse of God. And there are many ways he wants to teach us. And one of the quickest ways to learn is through visions. He has taught me so much when I had been slain in the spirit. I remember one time he gave me a vision of myself. And in this vision, I had a, a blue, kind of like a jumpsuit on with my red boots, my red cape, 
and a little crown around my head. I was superwoman. <laughs> you know, if you're a mother, you have to be superwoman to the family. Amen. How many of you all have been superwoman to the family? My youngest child used to say that my purse was the family survival kit. <laughs> And as I was down there, the Lord showed me shrieking through the atmosphere with my cape flying behind me. He said, I didn't create you to be superwoman. I created you to be a worshiper. And when he told me that, it freed me. I didn't have to be superwoman anymore. It sure simplified my life. I didn't have to rush and fill every void that everybody had. I could be free. I could be free. How many of you are, the, are people who want to be helpers to everybody? One thing we forget to do when there is a need, we are often pray and say, Lord, do you want me to be the one to fill this need? And oftentimes the person who expresses the need tells you that something has to be done right now, right now, immediately. If it's Right now, it's probably not God. Because the Lord will always give you time. To get his okay. Or his, don't do that. Do you know people who are perpetually in need? I know them. I'm sure you know them. They always have a need, and they're always coming to your door. Can you help me with this? Or on the phone, can you help me with that? How many of you all know people who are perpetually in need? Right. Always ask God before you meet that need, because it may be that the Lord has them in that bind because he's trying to deal with them about something. And if you're always rescuing, they will never learn. Mothers have come to me whose children are rebellious. Maybe they're doing drugs. They're not living the right life. And they'll come to me and say, Oh, I'm afraid my son's going to get in jail. I don't know what I'm going to do. They're just frantic. And I said, if, if they land in jail, don't you run down there and get them out of jail. You leave them in jail. Because if you're always getting them out of jail, you might be binding the hand of God. You know, some people are slow learners particularly teenagers. How many of you have found out that some teenagers are really slow <laughs> learners? <laughs> My grandson was in a, had a friend who was not a good influence. His, this, his friend was a pastor's son, but he was a very rebellious kid. And he got my grandson in trouble and the police picked them up and put them in jail. And my daughter had enough wisdom to leave him in jail. And in this jail, he was put into a cell with several men, and one of them was this really big black man. And I think this black man, he was really sent of the Lord. He had only one eye, and he was really scary to look at. 
and he comes to my grandson, who's about my height, and he says, boy, what are you doing in the stale? <laughs> my grandson's hair that stood on him. <laughs> and he says, you don't believe you belong here. But it just scared the bejeepers out of my grandson. And it scared some sense into his rebellious heart. Hallelujah. And when he got out of the jail, he walked a whole lot straighter than he had before. <laughs> so for some people, it takes a whole lot. Don't rescue people. Always consult the Lord first. Hallelujah. When you're down on the floor, like I say, this is holy ground. Don't let kids run around or play. I've seen kids jumping over people on the floor. That's it, it's not it's not holy. And I want you to write this down. When you're down on the floor, there are three questions you should ask or talk to the Lord about. Not a question, but it just a request. Say, show me what you want to show me. We see this in the Bible that God showed these holy men things. Show me what you want to show me. The next one is teach me what you want to teach me. Teach me what you want to teach me. We every day are in the schoolhouse of the Lord. There are things he wants to teach us, there are things he wants to reveal to us. And the third one is, take me where you want to take me. Take me where you want to take me. One time I was saying in the spirit, and I felt the Lord lift me up from the ground. And he carried me across the Atlantic to England, to England. And he began to show me political situations that were in England. And I began to travail and travail in tongues, interceding for the nation of England. And then after a time, he carried me across the channel, English Channel, to the next nation, for me to intercede for that nation. And then again, another nation. The Lord took me around the world in the spirit to intercede for the nations. God wants to enlarge your prayer life. He will show you things and you will know things about nations and people who are heads of nations before it hits the newspaper. I never realized our news, news was managed until I had came back one time from overseas and it took six weeks for things that I had seen with my eyes happening overseas to make it to our newspapers because the news is managed. But God can show you, just like he showed Ezekiel and Daniel and John the Revelator showed them things and showed them things that were going to happen. And Jesus said with the infilling of the Holy Spirit, he will show you things to come. Intercessory prayer is important. It's a hidden ministry. It's almost like a secret ministry. But my life and the life of my husband has been spared because somebody interceded for us.
My husband and I went back to Australia one time, and this woman came to greet us at the airport. She came running to me and she said, what on earth were you doing at such and such a time and such and such a month, such and such a day? And I said, well, I don't know. I'd have to look in my spiritual diary. And when I looked, I saw that this, at that time, we had been in Guayaquil in South America. And we had been in a, 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 a kid's camp for, say, 10 days. And we were going from the mountains of Ecuador down the mountains. It was late at night, way after midnight, down to the sea coast so we could have more meetings the next day. And the missionary who was driving us was absolutely exhausted. He was so tired. He really shouldn't have been behind the wheel, but we had to get down to the seacoast for the meetings the next day. And right there in front, all of a sudden, this, this avalanche was across the road. This woman told me that on that day, she was in her kitchen, and she had such a burden for me that she fell on her kitchen floor on her face and wept and cried out to God to protect me. And because of her prayers, because she was faithful, not knowing why she was praying, not knowing what was happening in my life, but being faithful to the call of God, I'm here today. That's how important intercessory prayer is. You might have that call to prayer, the inner call to prayer, and you might know what's going on. But be faithful, because a life might be hanging in balance. And you may find out later what you prevented, because you were faithful. Hallelujah. The Lord is looking for faithful followers. It's not always convenient. Here she was cooking. That's not a good time to have to <laughs> stop what you're doing <laughs> and pray. <laughs> but thank God she was faithful. Hallelujah. I don't know if I recounted this experience that this woman had. She was a, a, a black that's up in Pennsylvania. We were up there in meetings and she, she testified and she said that the Lord had spoken to her and prayed over her car. Did I share that one with you one time? Maybe I shared it with you. And she thought, that's weird. Why should I pray over my car? And she came down the steps and she told her mama, she said, Mama, the Lord's telling me I need to pray over my car. Your mother said, what's wrong with your car? She says, nothing's wrong with my car, but the Lord says to me to pray over my car. And her mother said, if the Lord told you to do it, you'd be better do it. So she and her mother prayed over her car. The car was fine for months. One day she was coming home very late at night. And it was a horrific accident that she had off the road. The police found the car, smashed, couldn't open the doors. They had to call the jaws of life, of course, the ambulance, everything, to get the body out because nobody could have survived that. And when they ripped the car open, she pops out. Not a scratch on her. Yeah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Because the hand of the Lord was on her and she had been obedient to that which God had commanded her to do. Not understanding why. To her, it didn't even make natural sense. But God sees what's ahead. And He loves us so much that He will warn us. And when we're faithful, 
a life to be saved. Hallelujah. Isn't that wonderful? I was going to say, wouldn't you like to have experiences like that? Well, not quite like that. <laughs> but to come to know him in that way is wonderful. Ramp up your prayer time with God. Come and meet with him every day. Set a time in your day that's going to be your rendezvous with Jesus. What is a rendezvous? A meeting in love with Jesus. He's the lover of our souls. And when God made man, made Adam and Eve, he made them with a chamber in their heart that only he could fill. And this is why we are never satisfied. We never find complete fulfillment in life until we have met the Lord and are moving into the things of the Holy Spirit. And God is looking for lovers. God is looking for lovers. You'll never find the time, you have to make the time to come into his presence. You make the time for your bath, you make the time to brush your teeth, you make time to comb your hair, look presentable. Make time for Jesus. Because there are places he wants to take you. The blessings he wants to pour into your life. He wants to bring healing into those hurting places in your spirit. And he has it for you because he loves us. Even if we've been rebellious and have run from him and we're afraid to come to him, don't ever, don't ever be afraid to come to Jesus. I remember when I had been advised to ramp up my prayer time in tongues to an hour a day. I thought, my gosh, I've got four children. I'm helping with this big uh, building program because there are very few men there, so we women were doing men's work. I learned how to put up sheet rock. I wallpaper so many rooms, I can't even remember how many. I'm, I'm the best window painter you ever saw. Hallelujah. <laughs> I can put on a roof, drive a truck with five forward speeds and air brakes. <laughs> God will use anybody who makes themselves available. Hallelujah. And I thought, how am I going to find time every day to pray an hour a day? Well, I found that the time that was easiest for me was midnight to 6 a.m. in the morning. And I've had some incredible experiences with the Lord. Incredible experiences. It's worth the time. We have a, a wonderful Lord that we worship. And I want to make you so hungry to move into the secret place of the Most High that you might abide under the shadow of the Almighty. There is that place that God has for us to walk in where you can even feel his way over you. You can feel the warmth of his body. You can feel love like you have never experienced, that it so transcends human love, that it passes description. That place of safety where the enemy cannot touch you. Wrapped up in the love of Jesus for us.
But when I started these long times of prayer, God began to open up my past to me. And one of the things he showed me, when he took me to when I was like 10 years old, and I was sitting on the back porch of the rectory, my father was a pastor, and my little brother, three years younger than I, who never got spankings because he was mother's favorite, it never made me very happy with what he got away with. <laughs> Suddenly, I heard the back door slam, the screen door. My mother, in this vision, comes rushing out of the house, grabs my little brother, pulls down his pants, and gives him what for on the seat of learning. <laughs> and I was so happy. <laughs> he finally got what he deserved. And in recalling that incident in my life that I hadn't thought about it for years and years and years. I mean, it was way back buried in my subconscious. <laughs> I suddenly realized that I was jealous of my brother. Now, if you had asked me if I were jealous of my brother, I would have said, of course not, I'm not jealous. He doesn't know the Lord. Not spiritual. He's had his life has been a mess. He's brilliant. He's absolutely brilliant. He has his PhD. Worked for the Federal Reserve right up next to Bernanke at one time. But his life is so empty, purposeless. There's no fulfillment there at all. He's got plenty of money, but money will not make you happy. How many of you have found out money will not make you happy? You've learned a lot if you find that out. Because the world says what you need is power, position, and money, and you, you'll be happy. But that's not true. I've known very wealthy people, and they're all miserable. <laughs> How many of you have known wealthy people who are miserable? Yes. But God was showing me that there was this clinker in my finger. <laughs> this jealousy towards my brother. And it broke me. And I went and I said, God, take it out of my spirit. Take it out of my spirit. When we ask him to take out the things that ought not to be in our spirit, it just makes more room for Jesus. And we were created, Adam and Eve were created to worship the Lord. And God would come down into the Garden of Eden and fellowship with them. And that's what God is longing for. He's longing to come to you and to me to fellowship in that love walk with him. And when you begin to move into that place, your whole life will be so full of meaning and you'll have a new joy in your heart. Even though Jesus was called the man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, yet Jesus said, I tell you these things that my joy might be in you and that my joy might remain in you. So he was also a man of great joy. And this is one reason why so many people were attracted to him, not just for the miracles, but for the way he just exuded joy. And people who have given everything to the Lord and are walking full time with the Lord, do you find that they're happy people? Unusually happy people. Even when bad things happen, there's this resilience that rise, causes them to rise like cream in milk. Hallelujah. Do you hunger for that kind of joy? God has it for you. Spend time with him. And tell him you want him to show you when you're down there on the floor what he wants to show you. 
ask him to teach you what he wants to teach you. And ask him to take you where he wants to take you. He may want to take you on a prayer journey like he has me many times. Hallelujah. One thing that happens is that it, re it releases you from the control of people. And that's a big release. You begin to realize how much God should, loves you because he begins to pour his love upon you. Begin to understand what it is being in God when you're enveloped in his presence. And he will show you things to come. Are you hungry? He has it for you. And he is hungry for you to come into that deeper place with him because he is the lover of your soul. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for what is in your word. We thank you that we can see greater possibilities than we've ever been aware of. That there's so much more of you that we can have that we don't have yet. And that you are available to the prayer. The altar is open. It was a